Good morning and welcome to our third quarter investor briefing for 2022. This quarter, as every quarter, we value the opportunity to reconnect with you, our closest partners. Our mantra at the foundation is greater together, and we're not only grateful to work alongside you to build a Milwaukee for all, but we also derive our energy from your partnership as you invest in a community that we all love. We know that you're here to hear from Mike Miller on our investment strategy. Before I turn the virtual podium over to him, I'd like to share with you the foundation's focus over the past couple months. As a community foundation, one of our key roles is to address urgent needs, even as we advance strategies for deep and lasting change. Right now in Milwaukee, we see the rise in violence and the resulting trauma as the critical need that requires immediate response. Since the onset of the pandemic, Milwaukee has experienced a significant rise in homicides, non-fatal shootings, reckless driving, suicides, and overdoses. These uh, uh, these incidents have escalated in 2022, exacerbated by the presence of COVID-19. At the foundation, we rely on data, community insights, and partners to act with intention to determine where and how to invest resources. And we've done that this summer with a focus on supporting violence prevention and community healing. Violence affects the entire community, but its disproportionate toll on communities of color is tied directly to unjust systems. True to our North Star of racial equity and inclusion, the foundation's focus is on supporting people and places that build relationships, increase belonging, prevent harm, and restore hope for a Milwaukee for all. Earlier this summer, in direct response to this emerging crisis, the foundation dedicated an initial investment of $1 million to support urgent healing community building and violence prevention efforts as the first step in a multi-phase effort to support long-term change. The foundation was able to act quickly thanks to the foresight of donors who, whose philanthropy included the gift of flexible funds for a future they could not predict. Similarly, in 2020, at the onset of the pandemic, the Milwaukee Response Fund was seeded with the foundation's flexible dollars to support relief and recovery. We were able to make grants from this fund throughout the pandemic, thanks to donors who came before us and to so many of you who gave generously, increasing the size of this fund tenfold and significantly increasing our ability to touch those most impacted. This fund is tailored to address the most pressing community needs in times of crisis. As we pivot to meet today's crisis, we're investing new gifts to the Milwaukee Response Fund to prevent violence and promote peace and healing. We're putting dollars into the hands of partners quickly, and we're delivering on our commitment to center community members as decision makers on where the funding goes. As an example, one of our partners funded through the Milwaukee Response Fund is the Mahogany Cares Foundation, a nonprofit focused on women's wellness, mind, body, spirit, and family, whose mission is to end generational cycles of violence by supporting survivors and educating the community on the effects domestic violence has on everyone. CARES stands for Community Awareness, Resources, Education, and Support. The grant from Milwaukee Response Fund was made to support their Survivor Like Me domestic violence and sexual assault support groups. The foundation is here to bring people together, donors and community leaders investing time, talent, and treasure in programs that make an impact and in change makers working in our neighborhoods. This will only work if we work together. We're all Milwaukeeans, Milwaukee is our home, and we're all part of the foundation because we care about our home, our families, our friends, our neighbors, and our kids. Everyone should be able to enjoy what makes Milwaukee special, our parks, our festivals, our beloved bucks, and we're all philanthropists. At a time when many may feel hopeless or helpless because the loss is too deep or the problem is too big, we can come together to be part of our community's path to healing. Today, we're calling on you to make a contribution to the Milwaukee Response Fund at any level that is meaningful to you to support these efforts and to bring hope and change. It's essential that we act together and that we act now. If you would like to join us, you can make a gift through our website by going to our homepage and clicking on the Milwaukee response icon in the carousel, 
or by contacting your philanthropic advisor. As always, we thank you for our trust in us and for your continued hope and action as we create a region where everyone thrives. And now I'm happy to welcome Mike Miller, our faithful friend and investment expert to the conversation for our third quarter market update and report. Good morning, everyone. And I'm sorry, repeating myself, I was on mute. Um, very nice to be here with you all. And thank you, Kristen, for that really amazing introduction and, in, and information, um, which reminds us of uh, how serious the issues are that are faced in all communities and in the greater Milwaukee community and why the investment results that uh, we work so hard to put together are, are so very important. Um, and as many of you are aware, we live in a very complicated time uh, as a society and, and also from a capital markets perspective. And I will, of course, focus on the only thing I know a, a little bit about, which is the latter. Um, so if we jump to the next slide. Uh, this gives you a good uh, look at the returns of the portfolio. I'm going to show you a couple other perspectives on this. So the first thing is a very uh, unfortunate thing you can see on the left side of the graph are the returns of the portfolio compared to benchmarks. And the left side is the one-year numbers, which are, as you can see, quite, quite, uh, quite weak on an absolute basis. So the blue bar is the Greater Milwaukee Foundation's investment return. The gray bar, which we're going to talk about a lot today, is the consumer price index plus spending. Uh, the red bar is a simple mix of 70% global stocks, 30% uh, bonds, and the green bar is a custom market benchmark, which we use to uh, measure the efficacy of the foundation's investment strategy because that custom benchmark mimics the portfolio's strategic asset mix, which is approved by the investment committee uh, every year and is part of the investment policy statement. So the first thing you can see, the, the part of this graph that is, um, cannot be missed is, is, again, those left bars. Uh, capital markets have been very weak this year. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes and, and some different from a variety of perspectives. But what, of course, stands out in, in the tell me something I didn't already know category is how high that gray bar is. And you can see the uh, inflation rates have been, of course, quite high. Um, and so that's obviously become a huge challenge to philanthropic capital. Uh, as you look across the page, you'll see a couple things emerging. One is um, that until you get out to 10 years and 20 years, um, the foundation has not kept up with the consumer price index plus 5% over these shorter periods of time. It has done so over the longer periods of time. And that's going to be a really important uh, concept to discuss as we go through today's presentation. However, uh, even for the shorter periods of time, the red and the green bars, which are really more market uh, opportunities. So the consumer price index plus 5% isn't something we can invest in, unfortunately, not directly at least. So we're not going to always be able to outperform it when markets are weak, particularly as we've seen in the last year. Um, but with that said, um, the foundation's results are well above those benchmarks. I'm going to give you another view of that in a minute. And that's been a big difference maker in terms of results. And frankly, the point that I really want to leave you today is that the story that we're looking at here is probably going to stick around. And we're going to have challenging times when it comes to outperforming consumer prices plus spending. And so it's going to take the kinds of results the foundation has historically generated to get us to that promised land, proverbially speaking. And so these are really important concepts to think about and talk about and how do we get there, which is going to be one of the subjects of, of the presentation today. So we go to the next slide. So these are the exact same results you just saw, believe it or not, uh, but the big difference being that these this, this set of slides, this set of numbers, excuse me, are cumulative returns. So the, the slide before were per year. So we take the return and we just, it's not really a multiplication exactly, but we multiply times 10 if it's a 10 year number. This is the, we take the average, excuse me, I get this right. So this is the multiplied out return. This is the actual cumulative compounded return. And what it does, which is really interesting is it, it shows you particularly with the longer periods, 10 and 20 years, how much different the results have been when you start to compound things out. So what looked like very small gaps on the slide before for 10 and 20 years are actually much bigger than they looked. And I think that's particularly true over 20 years where you can see the portfolios return just over 300%, slightly behind that CPI plus spending, but that's well above the 250, 260 in cumulative return that's been generated by the benchmarks. And, and that's a really important part of the equation. And I will say, while we have to continue to succeed, of course, this story for 20 years is really important. If we had invested in just a simple stock bond mix or in our own benchmark, we would have had a gigantic hole to catch up on in terms of getting back to that gray bar. But our blue bar is sitting right on top, basically, of the gray bar. It's so close that you can almost touch it. And that's really important because I will say post June 30, the portfolio is actually up quite a bit and it has actually started to close that gap quite quickly and has also uh, gotten rid of about 
a third of the losses are now gone that you're seeing here. So we'll hope that stays the case, but at least for now, there's been some recent relief. Now, if we go to the next slide, um, the other point I think that's worth commenting on here is that the foundation's returns are not just stronger than their own benchmarks, it's stronger than the vast majority of other endowments and foundations. And so what you're looking at here is something called the Invest Metrics database, which has about a thousand endowments and foundations that report into it. And those uh, foundations and endowments are, you know, cover a variety of types, colleges, and universities, private foundations, community foundations, et cetera. And the way you read this chart or table is in the green bar in the middle of the page, you can see the community foundations return. So these are the numbers that were on that first slide, which we showed you graphically. And now you can see underneath that, the medians. And what's interesting is the foundation's returns have been considerably higher than the medians over time. Again, these numbers don't look like a big deal, but they really are. As you think about that graph I showed you a minute ago with the compound return differentials, differential, excuse me. Then there's this gray shaded area, which is the invest metrics quartile. And so that means where do we sit in terms of this distribution? So the median is the middle. And then there's the question of, you can get a little more nuanced than that. First quartile, it means you're in the top 25% of other of the participants. Second quartile is you're above the median, but not the top. Third quartile is you're below the median, but not at the bottom, which is the fourth quartile, which is the bottom 25% of participants. And again, of these thousand or so participants. So for the year, we're in the third quartile. Uh, for those of you who've been at these uh, sessions in the past, we've been in the third quartile for short-term periods all the time. We are sometimes in the fourth quartile. And part of the reason for that is that we are doing some things that are very different than other people are doing. And that can create some short-term pain at times, but all in the pursuit of long-term opportunities and long-term success. And that's what you can see at the longer periods here from three, five, seven, 10 years, top quartile. And for 20 years, which again, that was that period from the other graph where we got very close to achieving CPI plus spending, whereas the others fell woefully short, uh, we're in the top decile, which means the top 10% of endowments and foundations. So we're not trying to be consistent here because consistency is just a convenient thing for us. We don't even know how to do it, frankly. What we are trying to do is ensure that we get to these types of situations. And by the way, we're not rooting to be top decile to take over the CPI plus spending. We're rooting to beat CPI plus spending. If everyone can do it, that would be great. Uh, the fact is we're a little pessimistic about the prospects of that, and I'll come to that a little bit later. So if we go to the next slide, uh, I mentioned that we're not trying to be consistent, and that is true. However, we do think about whether or not we're being consistent or not, because the reality is that no matter how long-term you are, uh, everybody, we know we all as a group sit down quarterly and we look at these results. And every time you hear about the results, it impacts the way you feel about the investment strategy. It impacts the way we feel about the investment strategy. It impacts the way the board feels and the investment committee feels. So you don't want to have a strategy that works once in a blue moon. You need to have a strategy that works most of the time. Unfortunately, they can't work all the time because you have to give up something on the long term to get that. So this graph, I think, is your really interesting picture about how we think about investing, which the way you read this is the blue bars reflect the performance compared to the benchmark using rolling three-year periods. So literally from the mid nineties on, every single three-year period, I believe these are quarterly data that we're looking at here, uh, is a blue bar essentially. So the way you should think about what this graph says is first of all, there have been long periods in the desert and that's that left side of the page where we underperformed in that you know huge uh, uh, internet bubble in the late nineties, we underperformed by quite a bit. And then we had this period of very strong outperformance that followed it. Since that time, we've gotten a little more, I think, stronger, and the committee has also gotten stronger in terms of how we implement the strategy. We do a lot of the things that are more idiosyncratic today, and the objective of those things is to ensure that we don't have quite as much of a feast or famine element to the strategy. So that's why you can see what starts to happen next is the portfolio starts to shift, and there's a lot of blue bars that are, that are essentially higher and above the line. And that shows you a lot of consistency of outperformance, uh, which is really what we would love to do, but we're not willing to trade off that vis-a-vis -vis achieving CPI plus spending. The other thing that's worth pointing out, even in that late 90s, early 2000s period, look very carefully at the scales. The depths of the underperformance in the late 90s were about six percentage points under the benchmark cumulatively. The high points on the above side of the graph, the next period from 2000, 2002 or so, were basically up nine, eight, nine, 10%. So the other thing we think about is we need to have a high batting average and we also need to have positive skew. It can't be symmetrical. You can't outperform by five and underperform by five because then you're just, what, what are you doing? There's no point. So you need to outperform as much as you can and you need to outperform by a lot more than you underperform. That's how you create, from our perspective, 
confidence that what's being done is prudent and thoughtful and, and will ultimately succeed, particularly when you enter those periods where the returns just aren't what you'd like them to be. Uh, I really hate it. I'm sure you do too, but it happens and we're not going to be able to stop it from happening. So we need to make sure we can show you pictures like this and continue to make this picture you know, get longer and extend it uh, further and further into the future. So we turn to the next slide. Let's talk about the philosophy that got us here. Um, so if you want to have a long-term record of success, uh, it's best not to think too highly of yourself. Um, and so I think the committee is brilliant. I, I think they know they're good. Uh, I think they probably know they're a little brilliant. But with that said, if I thought they were too brilliant, I'd be nervous. Uh, because if you think you're too smart, you'll outsmart yourself. And so what we're trying to do here is come up with a very simple strategy that capitalizes on the natural assets, of, all pun intended, of the foundation to achieve strong long-term returns. And these are the three basic rules. And for those of you who've been to these uh, webinars before and the meetings we used to have, um, these are all very familiar. One is to think long-term. We're gonna talk about the strategic asset mix in a minute, which is based on that thinking, but we always think long-term. And second thing is we are not trying to predict what will happen next in the markets. Uh, markets can be extremely complicated, extremely volatile, and they're really, frankly, at the end of the day, they are just unpredictable. So we just need to accept it and not try to gain false comfort by thinking they're predictable when they are not. Uh, and last but not least, you have to diversify. And a lot of the things I mentioned earlier about idiosyncratic investing and doing things a little off the radar, those things are built on the idea that there's a diversification benefit to be had by thinking differently. Excuse me. So we go to the next slide. Here is the strategic mix. Now you'll see we have an exciting day. Uh, I think for those of you who've been to these before, I've, I've mentioned many times that the committee meets every year. I they meet more than once a year, but they meet once a year to discuss the strategic asset mix. That meeting just happened after our at our last meeting, um, and they changed the mix very infrequently uh, because this is a long-term portfolio. And when they change it, it's usually not because they have any, they, I know it's not because they have any market insight per se, they just do it because something has happened that makes it necessary or desirable to change. So when you look at the top, you'll see, first of all, if you look at either column, there's 62% in stocks so that did not change. So this is a very equity oriented portfolio. I think it's a really important thing to consider. Uh, we are willing to accept market volatility, we're willing to accept some short-term embarrassment because we think that we will achieve very high long-term returns as a result. There's also a bond portfolio, which is underneath, which has been for years very small. It's been very small because we have essentially uh, very low interest rates, as you know, we still have very low interest rates. I'll come back to that a little bit later as well. But we've tried to diversify the bond portfolio as much as we can. And you'll see here, we did make a shift uh, we lower the exposure to U.S. aggregate bonds. I'm going to show you a graph later, which really gives you some insight into why we did that. But essentially, we reduced the bond exposure there by 2%, and then we reduced the global bond exposure, which is bonds both in and outside the United States by another 1%. And the reason we needed that 3% essentially was we wanted to fund things that we felt more confident about on a long-term basis. One are private assets, which were increased by 3%. That's been a very successful part of this portfolio. It's a complicated area today, but it's one where we really are excited about what's happened and what will happen, just to be clear. There's a lot of really good things happening. And what's happening now in the markets is just, frankly, will I think ultimately be viewed as a, a multi-year blip, to be, to be clear. Uh, mission investments were also increased because this is another area of the portfolio where the, where the foundation can leverage its assets and do so in a way that preserves the long-term return potential of this portfolio. It's extremely important that we get that balance right. So that went up from 3 to 5%. And the last not least, to pay for that, we reduced the hedge funds again. Hedge funds have been actually a very disappointing part of the portfolio recently. We are not um, at all thinking that it's time to abandon ship by any means, but we did reduce them, and largely because we're more confident in the other areas. Uh, it was a little less about what's wrong with the hedge funds and what's right about the other points. So a long way of getting to there was a change. Uh, we will review this again a year from now. I wouldn't bet on another change, but we shall see. And I think I may have mentioned to this group previously, uh, watching the strategic asset mix change here is like watching grass grow. It does not happen quickly, uh, and that's exactly the way it should work. So we turn to the next slide. I showed you earlier the way the foundation has outperformed its benchmarks over time. Um, this is a really important part of the uh, strategy, and I will tell you, going forward, we think it's going to be the key to preserving the purchasing power of the foundation's assets. It's an extremely complex climate we're facing, and I will walk you through the reasons we feel that way in a minute. But getting back to match success, and we've had a lot at the foundation over the years, and it's not consistent. And every single manager, I got to tell you, in this portfolio 
has at one time looked like an absolutely brilliant idea and at other times looks like the dumbest thing that we could have possibly done. And it's extremely important that you have a reason to invest with people. Uh, and that's why we've we, we tried to lay that out here a little bit. So the first point, we have a very high bar. We do not we do not invest with managers whose goal in life is to beat the index by a small amount. Managers cost fees, as you know, they're higher fees. Everything I showed you before, by the way, from a return perspective, is net of the investment manager fees. I should have mentioned that before, but they do charge higher fees than index funds do. So therefore, if they're going to, if we're going to take on the expense and the risk, by the way, that they're not as good as we think they are, we need to get a big premium, and that's a very important part of this strategy: is to not do, is to not pay for mediocre returns. The second point, we have to see an edge. Uh, there has to be a reason a manager is going to do better than other people. Most of it has to do with, as you says on this chart, specialization, time horizon, like these people who think longer term than markets, and markets think in, it feels like milliseconds these days, but if you think maybe out two or three years, which isn't really that long, uh, you can have a huge edge over the markets. Concentration can be very effective. So if you find a, you know, an amazing risk reward as a manager, you know, put a decent percentage of your portfolio into it. We'll deal with that problem by not putting too much of our portfolio or the foundation's money with you uh, specifically, but the concentration can pay huge dividends. And the third point, which I think is so important, the fourth point, the ability to avoid emotional reactions and a strength of a client base. Um, and what that means in English is that you need to make sure that the other people who are investing with a manager have a mindset like we do, which is to be very patient um, and to therefore you know, give people time to prove themselves. On the bottom, you can see the things we avoid and then you can sum all these up in a simple statement. Do not take a risk where there's no compensation for taking a risk. That's the first issue. And those things that I listed there are examples of that. And the second thing is, even if these things are low probability risks, I, they happen, you know, it's a hundred year flood type issue. Things that can happen that are incredibly destructive should be avoided, uh, even if the risk of them happening is very low. We're happy to take on market risk. We're happy to take on bad judgment risk from time to time. We are not happy and we will never take on structural risk where there's a mismatch between the foundation strategy and other people at the table. So we we'll go to the next slide. I mentioned before that the secret to the success of the portfolio has been to think differently. Uh, and there's a lot of ways that can be expressed. It can be expressed by the age of the portfolio managers. We have some very young portfolio managers in, in, this, in, this, in this portfolio, excuse the redundancy, by where people sit in the world. Uh, there are people sitting on many continents around the world. We think that's extremely important from a perspective uh, a point of view. And the third thing is ethnicity and gender. Uh, people's life experiences are different as a result of ethnicity and gender amongst other factors. And so that sentence, I want to just read the sentence for you. The best managers bring a variant perception from indices and other investors. Variant perception in English is the idea that I see something differently than you see it and that someone else sees and someone else sees it. And when I, or you, if you're the investor, see something differently than the world and the markets, that's a huge opportunity. You might know something that a company is going to be able to do that other people just haven't figured out. And it in part comes from just having a different set of life experiences. So the idea here is so simple, yet so poorly understood in the broader, broader institutional markets, at least, which is that diversity and diversification start with the same six letters. And that is such a powerful concept. And so the idea of magic diversity is actually about a lot of things, one of which is we would all love to see a more equal playing field uh, for uh, in the investment management industry as well as every place in our society. But even if you don't care about that, forget it. What if you just care about returns? Diversity is one of the key factors that drive higher returns in the portfolio. And that is what drives this committee. It's what drives Crucial to go out and find you know, really talented people who bring variant perception to the table. So if you go to the next slide, this is the report card that we show every quarter. And I note that 0.9% um, of capital right now is managed by firms owned by people of color and women. And if you look at the right side, I can't even read that screen. It's, it's a little bit blurry on my side. It's about 20% of the portfolio here is invested with diverse managers. Um, and you know, like every manager in this portfolio, these are amazing investors. Uh, and our job is to keep finding more and more amazing investors and make our portfolio stronger. Oh, that's so much better, thank you. Um, so 20 and a half percent, that's perfect. So if we go to the next slide. Let's shift gears. Um, I've been alluding to what a complicated time we live in, and let's let's go right for it right now. And, and I think one of the messages I want to leave you with is that the foundation strategy is extremely well suited to what's about to happen and what is starting to happen. Uh, and I'll explain why in a minute. 
So what are the things that are creating anxiety? So first, for most people, it's actually short-term anxiety. Uh, we're sitting there looking at the values of our portfolios declining. Uh, we're seeing rising prices in terms of inflation. We're seeing a lot of things that unsettle us as human beings. And um, that is really important. And I'm for, and by no way being dismissive of how that makes us feel. It, it feels bad because it is bad. But <clears throat> our job and the committee's job and the foundation's job is actually to think longer term. And normally that's very comforting. We're saying, well, this too shall pass and it will, and we'll be fine. Uh, the reality is this time might be a little different, not because the current conditions are gonna persist indefinitely, but because there are things that are happening right now that lead us to think that long-term market returns are gonna be significantly lower than they've been for quite some time. And that's what's got us very anxious. Um, so the short-term is the short-term, the long-term is the thing that we cannot get wrong. So here are the four things that we are thinking about. First, inflation's higher. Um, and I know people get excited when it comes down a little bit. I know we all love that gas prices are a little bit lower right now. That's wonderful. But the fact is that there are structural forces that are building right now that suggest inflation is at least not going back to one or 2% per year. It's gonna come down from where it is today. But the idea that inflation is something we don't have to worry too much about, I think is, 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 is not true. Uh, so that's a problem. The second problem is that we have very low interest rates despite inflation being as high as it is. And we have very expensive equity index prices. Uh, the S&P 500 and large US growth names like Amazon and Apple and Tesla have been wonderful investments for the last decade. There's something really different happening right now and should be very disconcerting uh, to, for those indexes on a go forward basis. The third point, anchoring is dangerous. So what that means in English is that if a stock trades at $100 a share and it drops to 50, there's almost a natural human inclination to say, oh, I just got this thing on sale. And, and that isn't necessarily true. So we call that anchoring, where you think the 100 is the price. And when it flows below 100, it's a good deal. But what if 100 was never the right price? What if 20 was the right price? So going from 100 to 50 doesn't make it a good deal. It still makes it a terrible deal, but it just feels like it might be a good deal. And that's what we call anchoring. And that's why when we invest capital, it's so important not to look at the historical prices, to figure out what is the fundamental value of a business. And what in English that means is what kind of cash can it generate for the shareholders? I mean, that's essentially what a business is worth. And so anchoring is something that's happening very much in the markets today. We see it all the time. And it makes me nervous because I think people are making huge mistakes. I'm going to show you an example of that at the end. And last but not least, markets do tend to change following volatile periods. And so another thing I've just warned you about, if you're thinking about your personal portfolio or other places you're involved, if anyone who tells you the answer is, let's just go back into the stuff that was working so well for the last decade, um, that might work, but history suggests it won't. And I'll, I'll show you something about that a little later too. So let's move on to the next slide. So this is, um, this is the comfort graph. There is one in this presentation. So what this graph shows you is that if you look at the long arc of history, uh, and I know, I know you guys are getting copies of these slides, so you can read all these little pieces along the way, but these are basically a lot of very serious events that occurred through time. And the S&P 500 mostly rises, and, and that's a wonderful thing. And we are not arguing that won't happen going forward. This, this graph is important. The problem with it, though, is there are long periods of time. This is a very long horizon. You can see it covers about 100 years almost. There are periods that last 7, 10, 15 years where the S&P 500 doesn't go anywhere. And if that happens at the same time, you have three or 4% inflation, well, think about what happens to the purchasing power of someone's assets, if that's what your goal is, especially if you're spending 4.5, 4.75, whatever you're spending. If your goal is to earn eight or 9% per year to preserve purchasing power, and you earn two or three or nothing, that's a major, major problem. And so this graph is both comforting and a little disconcerting if you look at it very carefully. So let's go to the next slide. So the question becomes, where are we in this cycle right now? Is this, is this a time where we should be fearful or greedy? Uh, our answer is probably fearful. So what this graph is showing you is something called a Schiller ratio. Uh, no, so Schiller is a, is a guy named Bob Schiller. He's a professor at Yale. And he came with this idea that the way to value securities is to look at their 10-year inflation-adjusted earnings and use that as the E in a price-to-earnings ratio, so price divided by 10-year average earnings. So this graph shows you what the Schiller ratio has been uh, from the 1800s all the way through, through June of this year. And what's really interesting about it is you can see that the graph and the Schiller ratio have spent a lot of time in the last 20 plus years well above um, their long-term history. And the part that I'm not showing you here, but I want to just mention to you now, is that this ratio 
is an amazing predictor of future returns. Um, but let's be really clear what I'm saying. Not a predictor of 2022's returns or 2023's returns, but an amazing predictor of the next 10 years' returns. And, and the reason I say that and the why I base that on is that we've done analysis, which I think I may have shown in the past. I'm going to bring it back in another slide presentation some other day. I don't have it today. Is that if the Shiller ratio is low, which means people are pessimistic, by the way, when a price to earnings ratio is low, that means people are pessimistic. If the Shiller ratio is low, the future returns are actually very high. If the Shiller ratio is high, the future returns are very low. And actually, that makes perfect sense because under every other part of our lives, we like lower prices, right? Unfortunately, in the stock market, we actually really don't because we don't like the process of the prices dropping. It's almost like you're, you're selling the gasoline as opposed to buying the gasoline. And I think it's a really important thing to think about. So the point this graph is making though, on the right side is that even after dropping about 20% this year, the Schiller ratio is still 43% above its historical average. And the Schiller ratio math I mentioned earlier suggests that the index's returns on a go forward basis are probably between three and 4% per year. That includes dividends. Um, again, 2023, the index could be up 100%. I'm not saying it would be, but it could be. It doesn't mean it can't be only up three or 4% for the next decade. And that's what this is predicting. So again, nothing about the short term here, but some very pessimistic long-term news, particularly if you think about this was after what many of us felt was a very painful drop in the S&P 500, nowhere near the kind of pain that would get this ratio back to where it needs to be to suggest better forward returns to the index. So that's an extremely pessimistic point. My apologies, let's go to the next slide. But all is not lost. Um, and this is really important. This is why we're actually not as, uh, we're a little more optimistic than some of these slides might suggest. So this graph is a very crude way of trying to show you that not all stocks are created equal. Uh, not all companies are the same and not all stocks are the same. And again, remember, there's a difference between a company and a stock. Uh, a company, of course, is business. And a stock is what people will pay you for that business. And people just, frankly, because we're all human beings and we get emotion and we have emotions that drive our decisions, people just get too optimistic and too pessimistic about businesses. And there's where the opportunities lie. So what this graph is showing you is the percentage that is represented in these indexes by the top 10 companies. So uh, the Russell 3000 growth has about 1500 companies in it, same, same as the Russell 3000 dice. It's gonna be kind of divide the US market into two pieces. That's oversimplifying what they do, but that's basically it. And the way indexes work is the bigger a company is, which is the number of shares outstanding times the price, i.e. the bigger companies are the most successful ones, the bigger it's weight in the index. So the blue line that you're looking at on the screen, I'm sorry, I'm pointing at my screen. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, the blue line shows you what percentage of the Russell 3000 growth, which is the Apples, the Amazons, the Teslas, et cetera, is represented by those, just those 10 names. Remember, 1,500 stocks. Through most of time, they represent 25 to 35% of the index. Today, and this is about the same right now, they represent about 65% of the index. You can see the way on the right side of the graph the, that, has, that line has risen in, immeasurably. That's the what we would call the bubble in the S&P 500 and in uh, growth stocks in particular that has emerged over the last uh, 10 years, frankly, really mostly in the last five years, I should say. And unfortunately, that's not sustainable. Um, just like crypto prices, it's going to have to come back down at some point. It's just a matter of how and when it's going to happen. The problem is that there's a lot of capital in these things, much more than crypto. And it's not going to be a crypto crash. I'm not arguing it'll come down 90%, but it can come down quite a bit and or just generate really lousy returns, that 3 to 4% I referred to earlier or less over the next decade or two. And that will be very painful for, for, for everybody, but particularly for philanthropic organizations that are trying to earn 7 8 9% per year. You look at the red line though, this is important. That did not happen with the value index. The value index is not the same. Stocks outside the US are not the same. There are a million places where right now, we're not just seeing prices that are better than Apple and Amazon's prices. We're seeing prices that are absurdly low and suggest extremely high forward returns. And that dichotomy, I can't even tell you how excited it makes us. Uh, we don't want to root for the failure of Apple and Amazon as stocks, not companies, of course. But we are very excited to own this stuff that is so cheap that it doesn't make any sense. And that's because everybody's kind of rid, rid, excuse me, uh, run over to one side of the boat, which is those, which is that blue line you see there. So let's go to the next slide. So this is uh, something I throw in a bit of as a defensive remark. Forgive me for this. Um, you're, I'm exposing a part of my soul. Uh, I do not like when people say to me, uh, we show all these historical arguments and they'll say to me, it's a good question, which I don't like it. Well, what about if it's different this time? Um, what happens if that's the case? 
and 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 unfortunately, I, I who can who can ever not who can ever answer that question? It could be different. Of course, it could be different. But you know, the one thing that never changes, and this is why we wanted to show you this graph. The one thing that never changes is human nature. Uh, people behave in very predictable ways, unfortunately, uh, and these are the cycles of life and the cycles of time. And so that is something that, frankly, we spend a lot of time thinking about how do we take the other side of human emotion in a positive way? And so what this graph shows you is the, is the agony and the ecstasy, essentially, of being an investor in speculative assets in particular. So these lines, let me explain what this is. The red line is something called the triple Q, which is the NASDAQ 100. So this is, again, Apple and Amazon and today Tesla and all those types of names. And ARC, for those who don't know what ARC is, ARC is the is uh, Kathy Wood, which is who's a you know very very well known investor, uh, who's created a bunch of funds that are focused on investing in future innovation uh, in the economy. And by the way, just to be clear, um, we're using the ARC funds not because we're trying to pick on Kathy Wood or ARC specifically, but because it's an ETF, so it's really a neat way to track day for day for day what's happening. There are a lot of other investors who have done worse than Kathy Wood has done, just to be clear. So she's not being held out here as a symbol of, of as, as, a, as, the, as the quote unquote loser in this category. She's just representative, representative, excuse me, of what's happened to a particular strategy of late. So here's the thing that's really important about this graph. First of all, look at how closely these lines move together. So they're different time periods. The red line is showing you what happened from 1999 to 2002. The blue line, which is the ARC fund, shows you what happened from uh, 2020 to 2022, give or take. Um, and so what's important about this graph is look at how similar these lines are. You see the rise in the bubble on the left side where people got really excited about stuff. And it peaked in March of 2000, it peaked in February of 21 uh, for, for the innovation fund here. And then they come crashing down with a very similar pattern. It's kind of scary when you think about it. And the point here is that this is what human emotion looks like in the markets. Things get too far ahead of themselves and then they kind of come crashing down and look at those very painful periods where it looked like the worst was over. The blue line rises, the red line rises, but it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And we're not predicting that it's gonna get worse and worse and worse necessarily for the ARC funds here because they've already kind of surpassed the negative side at the bottom there from the right side, but it's really interesting. And let me be really clear, this is not a dual scale graph. So when people show you graphs with two scales, you should be very wary because you can make anything look like anything. This is the exact same scale. If you can read those periods at the bottom, they're the exact three month intervals, the same. And this is such a powerful point, which is that, hey, you know what? A lot of things change and a lot of things don't. So let's go to the next slide. And here's the part that I will tell you gives me great anxiety about the near term. Um, something really weird is happening this time around, which we haven't really seen in the past. So this chart is looking at uh, year-to-date performance for three different uh, ETFs, which are exchange-traded funds. Think of those as just combinations of stocks that you can buy as a single security in the market. So one is the ProShares Ultra Pro QQQ. So what that is, is that NASDAQ 100 index I've looked at before, um, but today's version of it, and it's leveraged. So it's, I think it's three to one. Um, so for every dollar the market goes up, it goes up three. For every dollar the triple Q index goes down, it goes down three. So it's, it's a very aggressive strategy. And you can see it's down 60% year to date. Uh, I think this was as of uh, a few days ago. The ARK Innovation Fund, which is what I was just showing you in the other slide, is down 50% year to date. And by contrast, we're also showing you the energy uh, select funds, oil and gas prices, you know, are higher, and that fund's up 38.6% year to date. So the weird thing uh, which is happening and unfortunately, this is a sad part about investing, but the fact is that markets don't usually change until people give up on what's happening and, and say, okay, they throw in the towel collectively. And look at the right side of this last column, which are the year-to-date flows into these three indexes. $7.8 billion has been added to a leveraged bet on Microsoft, Apple, and Amazon. Uh, $1.9 billion has been added to a fund that's down 50% that owns, frankly, you know, now I'm going to sound judgmental, owns some really crappy businesses um, that just sound good. And then the Energy Select Fund has actually had money taken away from it, even though it's up 39%. So this is all backwards. And, and our argument would be, as we think going forward about how patient we might need to be, and this might, does not the work, but it does worry me, if there's no capitulation, um, then this has to go on longer. And that's the theory here, at least. And when we people we start to see people taking money out in droves, particularly from things like leveraged uh, bets on Microsoft, 
uh, we'll feel a little bit better about what the near term is going to look like. With all that said, that does not influence our strategy. It just prepares us mentally. We want to have a prepared mind for what might happen next in the markets. So let's go to the next slide. So here's the game plan. It's a game plan that doesn't change very much over time. We are going to stay diversified. We are going to stay focused on long-term uh, outcomes. Uh, we are amazed at the bargains that are available today and can't even begin to tell you how much we're looking at our chops for what these returns are gonna look like a few years from now when people come to their senses. Uh, but with that said, there's a lot to think about, a lot to do. And the last thing I will say is we're going to continue to capitalize on our access to top investors. This is a large portfolio. It can invest with a lot of people that are way off the radar of most investors uh, who are extremely talented investors themselves, who are very aligned with the foundation in terms of the pursuit of returns. And that is really what the secret has been to the long-term success of this portfolio. So to really boil it all down, stay long-term do the things that we've always been good at and just keep doing them and don't get tempted to do things that we don't know how to do. So that's why, you know, we're not suggesting we're going to predict inflation for the next six months and make some kind of portfolio bet on that. We're not going to tell you whether value stocks do better than growth stocks. We don't know. But we do know is we're going to own both. We're going to own people who are very selective in terms of what they own and where we can't find good people, we're going to own the indexes and we're going to be, I hope, very happy. Uh, and so the last slide, I believe, is a quick Crucial Partners commercial. Uh, the only thing I'll point about us is that we've been around a long time. I've actually been at the firm myself, 36 years. Uh, I started when I was six. Um, and the reality is that uh, we're very focused on long-term outcomes as you are. And that's why we've had a wonderful partnership with the Greater Milwaukee Foundation all these years and look forward to hopefully many more in the future. So I think that is the end of my remarks and I'm gonna hand it back to Joseph, I believe. Uh, thanks for that, Mike. As always, lots of good information. Uh, we do have a few questions here, so I will kind of facilitate the Q&A and bounce those over to you. Um, again, just a friendly reminder to all of our friends with us today, uh, go ahead and log your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom. Uh, the two that we've received so far both have to do with mix of portfolio. Uh, so the first one uh, has to do with hedge funds in the GMF portfolio. And the person is wondering um, if they're still good at facilitating price efficiency in the market, uh, given all of the unknowns across the board. Ooh, that's a really interesting question. Um, so let me, let me I'm going to Excuse me, if the questioner uh, doesn't like what I say next in terms of uh, actually trying to articulate their question, I'm sure they will stick that in the chat box and, and make sure we, we don't get the record wrong here. Um, so uh, when when that's a, such a really interesting question. So with the, the term price efficiency, what that means is, is the market price correct, essentially, is, is the way to think about that. And the reason that the person asking the question is saying that hedge funds can play that role is because if you think about a regular investment portfolio, like a mutual fund or a long only fund, we call them that you would own, a manager who says, I hate XYZ company, really only has one choice, which is not to own it, uh, which doesn't necessarily affect the price very much. A hedge fund manager, on the other hand, can do something we call short selling, which is they borrow the stock legally, sell it, a stock they don't own, and they're essentially betting the price is gonna drop. Uh, and so the reason that they, they help with efficiency or correct pricing in the market is this ability to short sell theoretically drives the price of an overvalued security down as opposed to not owning it, which doesn't do anything to it. So that's why hedge funds can contribute to efficiency because they can bet against a company as opposed to everybody else who's just betting for or not betting at all. Uh, betting is probably the right word. Um, so the question is, can hedge funds still do that and I will tell you, for the industry wide, I'd say less and less. And the reason is that because we've had 10 years of bull markets until this year, at least, uh, that and one other thing I'll get back to in a second, hedge fund managers have sort of as a group, not the foundations to be clear, but a lot of them have thrown in the towel on the short selling. It's been too painful, too much of a money loser. Uh, it's a very hard thing to do, by the way, if, and I won't get into the details of that, but it's a brutally difficult task. Um, and so a lot of them have sort of abandoned ship. And by the way, the, the signature event, which I'm sure all of you have read about or heard about, has been the meme stock craze. Uh, the Reddit crowd has literally taken the hedge fund community and just knocked their heads off um, because these stocks and the way they went up uh, back particularly last year and are starting again with it now, uh, make it so risky to be a short seller that a lot of people are just saying, you know what, forget it, I'm not gonna do it. So we still see some opportunity because other people have left the space. But the idea that hedge funds are helping with price efficiency, I think is less and less true today than ever. Hopefully I got the question right. Yeah, I think so. Thank you. 
Uh, the next one has to do with equity. Um, so first of all, a compliment uh, for all of the information you shared. And then the question, uh, this person is curious if your expectations for equities are three to 4% of the total return. And then a second part of that, uh, did the committee consider reducing equity allocations versus keeping the percentages um, steady? Um, uh, yes, I think that's the question. If, if you could take that one, Mike. Yep, absolutely. So uh, yes, yes to everything. Uh, so let me be more specific. Three to 4% is our expectation uh, for things like the S&P 500 on a go forward basis. Um, so that's a pretty, pretty difficult number to want to be uh, comfortable with. Now, our expectations for other equities, value equities, non-US equities, smaller companies, et cetera, are quite a bit higher. Um, we would argue seven to 8% is actually a very reasonable expectation for those securities because they've underperformed so much and they're so much more attractively priced. And we actually think some of the managers in this portfolio have 15 to 20% expected returns on a go forward basis from equity portfolio. So there's a wide array of outcomes that we're thinking. What worries me, and I'm sure the person asked the question realizes this uh, and others, the three to 4% stuff, most people own a lot of that stuff and they may or may not think that's gonna happen. They may or may not realize it could happen. I don't know. But the fact is there's a lot of capital sitting in these low return equities. So wide range, which is why to answer your next question, we didn't really, we did talk about cutting the equity exposure, but didn't do it. And we didn't recommend it and the committee agreed uh, because we like the perspective in terms of this portfolio. But I do wanna add on one more point. Capital allocation is about the absolute outcomes you can get from equities, but also what do you think you're going to get from other places? It's all a, it's a competition for the dollar, right? If you think about it. So if the bond market, for example, had 6% expected returns, that's seven to eight in equities doesn't sound so good anymore, does it? Because you know I could own something much less risky and get six. Why would I own something really risky to get seven? Maybe. Um, but since the bond market's so uh, basically expensive today with low yields, uh, that also gave us more food for thinking we wanted to own this type of equity portfolio. And then just to complete the circle, hedge funds and private equity are all very complicated asset classes. And one of the things particularly private equity suffers from, despite the amazing returns, is it's not liquid. Um, and you know, I was listening to Kristen before, and all the things that you and others in this community need and want to do, we need to have the cash. Uh, so we can't have a portfolio just dominated by illiquid assets. And so that's why we need to own public assets and stocks are better than bonds. Uh, thanks, Mike. Sort of on that note where you left off, um, we had a, another question here, sort of just generally speaking, you know, a lot of the folks on the call today work with us uh, that either have donor advised funds with us, you know, nonprofit endowments, you know, various fund types. But at the end of the day, you know, as we have these sessions and talk about investment performance, you know, what, is, what does that mean to our partners at the GMF? Uh, you know, who have those funds, who are using those dollars for their uh, charitable goals. Yeah, well, I think, and, and tell me, Joseph, I'm not getting the question right, but I think the way to think about it is to take some comfort in the fact that we think a lot about this balance between the long term and the short term. Uh, in the short term, we, we have to be able to provide you with capital to deal with, to work on all the things that you're working on. And at the same time, we can't sacrifice the long-term returns because the next, you know, hopefully when we all stick around long enough to be the, to be quote unquote the next generation, either us or the next generation will also rely on these funds uh, for many of us. And in that regard, we have to basically keep our eye on both sets of objectives. And the reason that, what that translates to in the portfolio is diversification. It translates into liquidity. And it translates into a thinking, a process around how do we generate that dollar of return with as little volatility as we can. Um, and the only thing we're not willing to do is to bring the volatility down so much, i.e. the bouncing around in the portfolio, that we won't be able to pay those bills 20 years from now. And so all those things come together in this concept of balance. And that's why, last thing I'll say, uh, I'm not saying it today, but a couple of years ago, and not here, but another community foundation, uh, a donor asked a really good question which is, all right, so you've earned you know, 8% per year for the last 20 years in, in this great portfolio, well done. But the S&P did nine and a half or 10. We would be better off if we had just put our money in the S&P 500. And, and actually that's factually correct. The problem with it is that S&P only portfolio doesn't do all those other things I just said, doesn't have the lower volatility that lets us pay the bills along the way, doesn't have any balance, it's all in 50 stocks. 
And so these concepts are really important. And this is what this is the art of what the investment committee and where the advisors is trying to do. Uh, well, that is great. Uh, thank you for, for that, Mike, and for your time this morning. Um, I think we're just about at time here, so I want to keep us moving along. Uh, thanks for everyone's questions this morning, which I always make this uh, an interesting time together as we uh, hear from people what's on their minds. Uh, so as always, we're grateful for your partnership and, and your trust uh, in the foundation as we work together to inspire philanthropy, uh, strengthen the communities that we all live in here in southeastern uh, Wisconsin, and uh, truly build a Milwaukee for all. So thank you for that. Uh, we covered a lot of information today. Uh, you know, you're hearing from the foundation regularly on some of the things that we're working on here, uh, one of which uh, Kristen talked about at the top of the program and another of which uh, Ken Robertson will talk about at the close of the program. As you have questions about any of that, uh, have interest in, in joining us in any of that work, uh, or just as you're thinking about the end of the year and doing your planning, uh, growing your funds, grant making from your funds, as always, we invite you to reach out to your philanthropic advisor for uh, help and assistance and guidance, and, and that's what we're here to do. So to close today's program, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Ken Robertson, the GMF's Executive Vice President, Chief Operating Officer, and Chief uh, Financial Officer. So Ken will close us out uh, this morning. Uh, thanks again for your time and, and your interest in your partnership. And uh, Ken, I'm passing it to you. Thanks, Joseph. And thanks everyone for being here today. In times like these, I'm especially thankful for our high performing teams. Teams like our staff at the Greater Milwaukee Foundation, partners like Mike and the crucial team who helps us steer our high performing long-term investments. And you are donors, partners that have so much passion for philanthropy and this community. I thank you. Super excited today to provide some updates on Thrive on King. Thrive on King is our shared commitment with developer Royal Capital and the Medical College of Wisconsin to advance racial, health, and economic equity. In the last six months, we've made some major strides. In June, super happy to report that our construction has officially begun. That construction is the renovation, the restoration of our former department store, the Gimbel Schuster's department store, um, turning it into our new headquarters with specialized spaces on the first floor for programs that were specifically identified by our community. If you drive past the site on King Drive and Garfield today, you'll see crews that have removed the metal cladding that for decades has hit this gym. Excited to see the real brick and excited to see what's coming. At the last quarter's meeting, I highlighted a $1.5 million impact investment for JCP Construction. JCP was able to use that money to fund and expand their employee workforce. And now they're on site with their sleeves work rolled up, working as one of our primary contractors for our project. Earlier this summer, we also announced that Versity, previously known as the Blood Center of Wisconsin, was named as a tenant in Thrive On. They'll use their space for employment opportunities, job skills training, community education, and blood donations. In April, we confirmed a dual investment in expanding access to our early childhood education. We're investing inside of our building. We selected Malika Early Learning Center to operate a flagship early childhood education center within the building. And we're also making a major investment of $5 million over the next five years to invest in facilities and programming with current providers in this neighborhood, Arambe, Halyard Park, and Brewers Hill. For us, 
It's always been about more than just the brick and mortar of our collaboration. It really is about our community and building a strong community for everyone. So humbling to be part of this work and so appreciative of everyone who shared their time, treasure, talent during this journey so far. So as we close out our program today, I'd like to thank Kristen for the important information she shared about our recent investments in violence prevention and healing. It's a timely example on how a community foundation can use its knowledge, tools, and resources to meet a critical need. As our year goes on, you can bet you hear more about our Drive On King collaboration. So for now, I'm signing off. We hope to see you again on Q4.